Imagine you're considering investing into AT&T. It's not a flashy stock like Tesla or Apple, but it's one of the oldest and most established companies in America. They pay a phenomenal dividend yield of 8.34%, and the men running the company grew it from being just a small phone company to being a telecommunications giant. Most would agree that such an investment would be quite safe. You may not make millions, but the chances of you losing money are quite low. Now, what if it was revealed that AT&T had been faking their financials for years in the magnitude of billions? What if they were secretly taking out new loans to pay off old debt and the entire front of AT&T was just a facade? At first glance, such a massive fraud may seem impossible to pull off. Yet, that's exactly what took place about two decades ago with a company called Worldcom. At their peak, Worldcom employed 80,000 employees and boasted a market cap of $180 billion, which is $2 billion more than what AT&T is worth today. Despite their massive size, the entire company would go bankrupt just one month after being exposed. So, here's how Bernard Ebers ran the largest accounting scandal in US history. Taking a look back, Bernard Ebers was born on August 27, 1941 in Edmonton, Alberta. His birthplace likely didn't mean much to him though as his family was constantly moving around Canada and America. His father was a traveling salesman so his job required him to consistently target new markets and customers. Despite the hectic nature of their lives though, the Ebers family was devout Christians. They tried their best to instill Christian values into all of their children, but unfortunately, it doesn't look like they were successful with Bernard. On the bright side, it looks like the family was finally able to settle down in Canada when Bernard was a teenager. And this is where Bernard would attend high school and college. It's not clear how Bernard performed academically, but he was a star performer when it came to basketball. After high school, Bernard would initially attend the University of Alberta and Calvin College before switching over to Mississippi College on a basketball scholarship. Unfortunately though, Bernard would get injured before his senior year in college. So he would be tasked with coaching the junior varsity team instead of playing. Though Bernard was disappointed by the turn of events, he actually really liked coaching. And he says that coaching played a massive role in his rise to the top. Anyway, Bernard graduated with a bachelor's degree in physical education and a minor in secondary education in 1967. After college, Bernard worked a bunch of odd jobs for a few years each. This included being a high school PE teacher, a basketball coach, a garment warehouse manager, and even a bouncer. But by 1974, Bernard decided to do something more long term and that led him to the motel industry. Bernard started off by purchasing a small motel in Colonel, Mississippi. Two years later, he would bring on some investors which allowed him to quickly expand his motel operation to 9 best westerns by the end of the 1970s. On paper, Bernard's net worth was skyrocketing as he paid off the properties. But in terms of cash, it was a different story. The motel chain was profitable but it didn't produce very much in terms of cash flow. So Bernard started looking for some more lucrative opportunities and that's when AT&T would be divested. The Department of Justice had been assessing the AT&T monopoly since 1974 and they had finally come to a decision. In 1982, they announced that AT&T must split up and relinquish control of the Bell operating companies. This resulted in AT&T splitting up into 8 different companies with only one of them carrying on the AT&T name. Ironically, AT&T would end up buying back half of these companies and the other half would turn into Verizon so this wasn't all that effective in breaking up the monopoly. But right after the divestor, it seemed like the telecommunication industry had finally opened up for disruption. Hopeful entrepreneurs flooded the space and one of these hopefuls was Bernard and his friends. In 1983, Bernard and three of his friends borrowed $500,000 against their properties and purchased a struggling phone company. They named the company LDDS or Long Distance Discount Service and with that, they had entered the telecommunications industry. Initially, Bernard tried to play a passive role by simply being an investor. But the thing to keep in mind is that this was a struggling phone company and that wasn't an accident. The original management was terrible and the new management they hired wasn't that much better. So the investors got together and decided to shake up management once again. They appointed Bernard as the new CEO despite his lack of experience. Bernard was actually very transparent that he didn't have any of the skills of regular businessmen. He admitted that he wasn't an engineer or an accountant, but what he was, was a coach. Bernard approached the job as being a coach for employees and this approach actually worked extremely well. Just 6 months after taking over as CEO, LDDS became profitable and Bernard could finally focus on growing the company. Initially, he attempted to grow the company the natural way. 
In November of 1983, LDDS got its long distance carrier certification, and their first long distance customer was the University of Southern Mississippi. But it didn't take long for Bernard to rely on acquisitions to accelerate growth. Over the next decade, Bernard completed dozens of acquisitions ranging from just a few million to a few billion dollars. Despite the large number of acquisitions, each acquisition was strategic and precise. Each acquisition expanded operations into new areas, reduced overhead, and built up the company's high-capacity fiber optic network. By 1995, LDDS had grown to being the country's fourth largest long-distance carrier, and Bernard would rename the company Worldcom that same year. Despite his massive success, Bernard was a very quiet and religious man that avoided the spotlight. Bernard was a member of the East Haven Baptist Church in Brookhaven, Mississippi, and he was a leading member of the church. He regularly attended church every week and he even taught Sunday school. On top of this, he named his four children, two of which were adopted, Treasure, Abe, Joy, and Faith. Bernard would also start every corporate meeting with prayers. Considering all of this, Bernard was literally the last person you would expect to be a fraudster. He was adopting children, he was teaching Sunday school, and it looked like he had extremely strong morals and ethics. And this was the case up until 2000. There's no evidence suggesting that Bernard was committing fraud before 2000. So his entire rise up from running a struggling phone company to running one of the largest telecommunications businesses in America was presumably completely legitimate. So what happened? Well, the answer seems to boil down to just one thing, greed. The only step left was for Bernard to overtake AT&T, but this would prove to be his biggest challenge. Bernard continued his strategy of acquiring his way to the top. In 1996, he purchased MFS Communications for $12 billion which made Worldcom a global player. And though this was a great buy, his next move would leave Wall Street stunned. In 1997, the second largest telecommunications company, MCI Communications, was looking for a merger partner. But instead of offering to merge with MCI, Bernard offered to buy the entire company for $29.4 billion. This started an intense bidding battle for MCI, but Bernard would prevail buying out MCI for $37 billion in September of 1998. Worldcom was officially the second largest telecommunications business in America. They were only one acquisition away from overtaking AT&T, and this acquisition would come in October of 1999. Bernard had made a deal with Sprint CEO to acquire the company for, wait for it, $129 billion. Many news publications actually reported the story as if it was already completed. And given that both parties were in complete agreement, all the money was ready to go, and that they just had a couple of formalities left, the deal seemed to be good as done. But then, Uncle Sam stepped in. In June of 2000, the DOJ sued to stop the acquisition, and that left the deal dead in the water. If the deal had gone through, Worldcom would have comfortably overtaken AT&T in terms of market cap. Their revenue would still slightly be less than AT&T. But given that Worldcom averaged 50% growth per year throughout the 1990s, it wouldn't take longer than a year for Worldcom to completely overtake AT&T. And that's exactly why the DOJ didn't like the deal. While this was a disappointing setback, it was still just a matter of time until Worldcom naturally outgrew AT&T. So it seemed like Bernard had still come out on top. But then the dot-com bubble burst and Bernard would resort to fraud. The dot-com crash killed the vast majority of tech companies, most of which would never return. But I think it's pretty safe to assume that Worldcom was definitely in the category of too big to fail. If Bernard simply reported the losses as is, Worldcom probably would have performed like Intel, Cisco, and Microsoft. They would have crashed 40-60% to and stalled out for several years. But it's very unlikely that they would have faded into oblivion. Bernard's actions, however, would ensure that the latter was the case. As the dot-com crash rolled around, Worldcom started losing billions per quarter. But Bernard faked the financial reports of the company and made it seem like Worldcom was actually making billions. Wall Street was pleasantly surprised while AT&T was scrambling. AT&T laid up tens of thousands of employees in an attempt to cut losses and close the gap to Worldcom. Yet, they couldn't even get close. Looking back, this was a clear major red flag. But it probably wasn't as clear as it was unfolding. Aside from faking profits, Bernard was taking out loans in his own name and the company's name in order to afford all the losses. Unfortunately for Bernard, he wasn't very good at this and it didn't take long for auditors and the media to catch on. In March of 2001, the Wall Street Journal drew attention to the massive amount of loans Bernard was taking out and the SEC got involved shortly after. About a year later, Bernard would be ousted from Worldcom. And just a couple of months after that, Worldcom would file for the biggest bankruptcy ever. Tens of thousands of employees lost their jobs, pension plans and 401k plans evaporated, and investors suffered substantial losses. Around the same time, Bernard would address his church and say, 
I just want you to know you aren't going to church with a crook. You could say that these were his famous last words. The SEC would continue their investigation over the next two years. And though Bernard never admitted to the crimes, he would be found guilty on all counts. And he was sentenced 25 years in prison in July of 2005. Bernard spent the next 14 years in prison, but at the end of 2019, one of his daughters was able to convince a judge to release Bernard early due to his deteriorating health and dementia. His daughter definitely wasn't lying as Bernard passed away just two months later on February 2nd, 2020. In the end, Bernard was actually a stellar businessman who was able to reach extraordinary heights. But eventually, success and greed got to his head, and he resorted to fraud which rapidly destroyed his life. If he had played it safe, it's likely that Worldcom would have been another household name like AT&T and Verizon. But instead, the only thing people know about Bernard today is that he orchestrated the largest accounting fraud in US history. Were you guys familiar with Worldcom? Comment that down below. Also, drop a like if you agree that greed is extremely dangerous. And of course, consider joining our Discord community to suggest future video ideas and consider subscribing to see more questions logically answered. But until then, I'm Hari, and I'll see you guys on the next one.